Greetings, and this presentation is called Descent versus Filiation. And this is in memory of Meyer Fortes, a social anthropologist who dedicated almost his entire career to distinguishing these two forms of ancestry. So we have two goals for this presentation. First, we're going to draw a contrast between bilateral filiation and unilineal descent. So unilineal descent, again, is tracing ancestry primarily through one gender for social purposes, especially corporate group formation, whereas bilateral filiation refers to the rights that humans in all societies draw from their parents. And this is an important point uh, to note. Even where there's unilineal descent, almost always there's also clear bilateral filiation. Secondly, we're going to define the concept of a universal kinship society and bring all of this back to Hamilton's rule. So we've discussed two basic systems of ancestry, filiation and descent. And now we're going to compare them and draw out some differences, especially in their social consequences. So filiation, we noted, is bilateral. And that means via both genders. And one consequence that we related to bilateral filiation is the exponential growth of ancestors to the power of two, such that in just 10 generations, we'd have over a thousand direct ancestors. And this necessarily caps our genealogical memory fairly recently in the past. Now, if we look at unilineal descent, it presents a rather different picture. So if we go one generation back and it's matrilineal, that means that we emphasize the mother and not the father. So we might filiate to the father, but we don't mark that as a key line for social group formation. If we go two generations back, well, now we've gone from mother to her father and mother. And again, we only emphasize her mother. So now we're emphasizing one grandparent out of four. If we go back yet again, well, then we're going from mother to mother's mother to mother's mother's mother. So at the great grandparents, we're only emphasizing one link out of eight grandparents. And that will continue in tracing unilineal descent into our ancestors. We're following just one link at each generation. And that means each step we go back, we exclude more and more possible links. So if we look at this animation again of matrilineal descent, that's a line from one female to the next to the next. And this means that there's just one link followed at each generation. And one way to think of this is that you're forgetting most of your ancestors in a unilineal system, just as you are in a bilateral affiliation system, but you're forgetting them in a different way. You can go back a lot more links in the chain unilineally and so you have greater depth genealogically, but you're following fewer possible links. So we noted earlier there's this connection between time depth and kin recognition. And this is really important. If kin recognition is significant in human societies, we have to inquire into systems of ancestry. And this shows how using patrilineal descent and following that one link, we're able to go deep into the past, but we're also able to come down and connect ourselves to other people through just one gender. So not always, but frequently, unilineal descent is associated with deep genealogies and an ability not to recognize all links to other relatives, but to follow out some links quite extensively. So we can start then with two initial contrasts. Bilateral affiliation involves both genders and tends to produce very shallow genealogies. 
And frequently these tap out at the grandparents or the great grandparents. So basically it's living memory. Unilineal descent follows just one gender, either patrilineal or matrilineal. And as a result, you can have very deep genealogies. You don't always see this, but it's a possibility. Again, you achieve that deep genealogy by ignoring most of the links that are possible to follow. Now we're going to make a new contrast, and this relates to their social results. So here we're going to stress what Meyer Forte stressed, and that's the association between descent and corporate groups. Affiliation, on the other hand, is associated with a social outcome that we call a network. So the question we're going to pursue right now, though, is just what's the difference between a corporate group and a social network? And social networks used to be kind of hard to explain, uh, but that was before MySpace and Facebook came along. So we'll start with corporate groups. And a corporate social group is defined by exceeding the individuals that it recruits. And this means that it can outlive them. It also means that it can replace them. So there's a distinction in a corporate social group between the individuals that it recruits into the group and the group itself. An example of this is Boise State University, especially now that we have our corporate logo. And obviously, if I were to leave tomorrow, uh, BSU would simply replace me and continue. And obviously, when you graduate, a BSU won't close the door, but it'll recruit new students and continue. As a corporate social group, it's only limited by how many people it can recruit, and that's usually tied to the resources that corporate groups have available. And this means that corporations can last a long time. Kin corporations presumably could last for centuries, American private corporations tend to last a matter of decades. Public institutions last longer. It could also get very big. And here we could say, well, the United States is also a corporate social group. It's been around over 200 years, and at this point it has more than 300 million members. And lastly, it's possible using unilineal descent for a corporate social group to define very clear boundaries about who belongs to it and who does not. So a corporate descent group is just a corporation based on kinship. So we have here a theory of corporate social groups that applies to state organized societies like the United States as well as small scale kin based societies and the idea here is that corporations in small societies are kin-based. And there's two kinds of these. One is called a lineage and the other a clan. We're not going to go into this in great detail. But generally the way to think of this in terms of the difference is that clans are made up of lineages. And associated with that, generally in a lineage you can name through genealogical steps the eldest ancestor in your lineage, but the sense that lineages belong to the same clan is usually based on hypothetical shared descent, in that people can't trace the common genealogy of the lineages anymore. They simply believe that they have shared substance and belong together. So think of a clan as a state and lineages like counties. A lineage is a subdivision of a clan. So lineages and clans, Forte stressed, occur primarily with unilineal descent and not bilateral affiliation. There's a big exception to the rule here that we're going to ignore uh, in this presentation. So bilateral affiliation produces networks, and we all now have this clear sense of what a social network is, that it's chains of individuals who are linked together and your own network depends upon your being there. 
Now, when a network is made up just of kin, it's built from chains of your kin, we call it a kindred. And one way to think of this is if everybody on your Facebook page is one of your relatives, then that's really your kindred that's on that page. Chances are for most of you that's not true, and that's a very interesting thing uh, to look into. This is chart shows a kindred, and you'll note that unlike a matrilineage or a patrilineage, everybody on this chart is potentially a member of ego's kindred. I say potentially because who's in your kindred um, depends on sustaining a tie with them. You have to actively seek out and keep that relationship. So all of your relatives are potentially part of your kindred, but chances are that you rely on some relatives much more than others. Now networks, if we look at their characteristics, and the idea that a network is small might seem counterintuitive given how large Facebook is, but consider most individuals' pages. Usually they have a, a matter of a dozen or a couple dozen close friends. They tend to be short-lived, and that's because they're anchored on the individual who's at the center of that network. And they also have very unclear overlapping memberships, and that means that you can belong to many different networks at the same time. So let's summarize some contrast here. Unilineal descent involves one gender and can create very deep genealogies using one gender. And descent groups that result from unilineal descent have all the characteristics of corporate social groups. They're hypothetically eternal. They can go on as long as they can continue recruiting members. They can get quite large. And certainly uh, kin descent groups don't get as large as modern states or corporations, but they still might have hundreds or in the low thousands of members. And they can have very discrete boundaries in terms of you belonging to just one of those groups, not, not multiples. Bilateral affiliation, on the other hand, involves two genders. Because of that, it's linked in traditional societies with very shallow genealogies. Um, it produces what we call bilateral kindreds. A kindred is a network and has all the characteristics of a social network in that they're ephemeral, they're short-lived. They tend to be small and involve dozens of people and they have a great deal of overlap between them. Now the last concept we want to discuss here is the idea that in small-scale human societies, kin terms are applied to everyone. And uh, note that the quote here also says, related or not. This means that people tend to think about everyone in terms of a kin relationship, even if they can't define a genealogical tie to them. And kin ties extend to the very borders of the known world. That quote is from an anthropologist named Richard Lee, who studied a group of hunter-gatherers named the Zutwazi. And among the Zutwazi, the only way people could interact was as kin. And we could pose the question, would Hamilton be surprised? And actually, there is a surprising dimension to this, and that's the kin terms are applied to people who are not related to us. And we'll be coming back to that in the next part of the course. Thank you for listening.